in Safety Wing, we are creating a global social safety net, like a membership for a citizenship. And that manifests through health, through pensions, through income protection areas that we're taking and creating products for on a global scale. The difference between having security and not having security is fundamental for your access to the risk you want to take in life. We believe that through a global social safety net, we will create equal opportunity and freedom. Welcome to the Work for Humans podcast. This is Dart Lindsley. All the best revolutions share this problem, which is how do you grow fast and at the same time preserve your organization's mission? More than that, your organization's soul. How do you grow a company that is both diverse and unified, distributed globally, and yet one thing? Adrian Salazar, head of culture and integrity, is responsible for navigating all these polarities at Safety Wing the company that's leading the movement to grow the first country on the internet by creating a social safety net for remote and nomadic workers around the globe. It's a design problem, and Adrian's roots are in design. Before Safety Wing, he served as head of brand at Mealco and head of design at both Selva and Kenzium Solutions. In this episode, Adrian and I talk about what it means to be the head of culture and integrity. How is Safety Wing creating the first internet-based country? And what does it mean to build a social safety net? And why is that so important to both the global remote and nomadic movement, but also human rights? We also discuss the importance of a company's value structure, overcoming obstacles to company culture, the benefits of doubting what we learn, and other topics. All right, before diving in, be sure to stay connected with Work for Humans by subscribing wherever you listen to podcasts. And now I present my conversation with Adrian Salazar. Adrian Salazar, welcome to Work for Humans. Hi, thanks for having me. I'm excited to have you on the show for a couple of different reasons. One of them is I have a show about the experience of work and how we should design work better but I don't talk to very many people who are close to the chief people officer role, which I know you're not exactly. You're the head of culture and integrity for Safety Wing. But it's an oversight in the show. And so I'm bringing on a few people who are in leadership roles like your own and talking about the problem space and the challenges that you face and the opportunities that you face. That's one reason why I really wanted to have you on the show. The second reason is that you work for Safety Wing. And Safety Wing is one of the companies that is enabling remote work and enabling global nomadism. And the interesting thing about that whole space, I've decided, is that if you really want to understand how people are designing the future of work, go see the extremophiles. Go see the people who are positive divergence, who are testing the edges of what's possible. And Safety Wing is enabling that. And so there's a cross-section here that I really want to explore. So just to lay some groundwork, how would you describe the mission of Safety Wing? We are creating a global social safety net for the first country on the internet. That's our mission and vision. Okay, I want to part that out. Could you say it again? Yes, a global social safety net for the first country on the internet. The first country on the internet. I think it's such an interesting idea. How do you describe the first country on the internet? So we have a name for it. The name is Plumia. Plumia will be a country on the internet. I'm not sure if the first one, it doesn't matter really. And I think I can summarize a country on the internet as a sort of citizenship by affiliation, like a membership for a citizenship. And what this gets you is a global social safety net, which I think is the most important thing that I could be doing with my life. And we can talk about that if you want. So it gets you that, it gets you a passport. Kind of fingers crossed, I have high confidence. I mean, why not? Why wouldn't it be possible? Just a matter of figuring out how to do it, which we are doing already. 
to get you a passport, a social safety net. And I believe the third important thing about it is that I believe that there will be several in the future, several countries on the internet. I think internet, like digital countries and say regular countries will fight for citizens. And I think people will join these countries by interest, by values, by culture, voluntarily. So I want to talk about the safety net. And then I want to talk about this idea because I already see happening that there is a population of people who are detached or very loosely attached to existing countries. And so they're so mobile and so nomadic. It's not that they have no passports. It's just that they're very loosely attached. And then the idea of giving up that last passport, potentially, that last passport to a physical country and saying, I am a member of this tribe. That may ultimately have disadvantages <laughs> to be completely detached, but being attached to a second country, which is an internet country, is a really interesting idea. I don't know what makes a country. It makes me realize because I think of what actually makes a country. It's a territory, army, many times, things like culture, affiliation. Yeah, it's a super interesting idea. I'm going to have to think of all the reasons why there's advantages to having a physical country. One of them is, for instance, if you commit a crime against an American any place in the world, the United States doesn't extend power to prosecute, but it does recognize that as a crime. So there are things like that. A hundred percent. Yes. So what is the social safety net as you see it? First of all, that Safety Wing is building out but also maybe beyond the edges of safety wing that needs to be built out. This is fascinating because depending on who you speak to, the definition of a global social safety net varies. If you speak to someone in South America, most probably they don't know what a social safety net is because I'm Peruvian. We don't have that. In Peru, if you don't, you don't have money and you, you're dying on the street, you will die on the street. And maybe that's a little dark for the show, but it is true. I've seen it with my own eyes. So we are modeling our global social safety net from the Norwegian one, which works quite well, apparently. I haven't used it, but it provides this foundational safety, security for people who benefit from it. And that manifests through health, through pensions, through disability, through income protection which are areas that we're taking and creating products about or for on a global scale. And that is the important thing because the objective of having a global social safety net is to be able to create a product that equalizes freedom and opportunity for people. The difference between having security and not having security is fundamental for your access to the risk you want to take in life and just access in general. So we believe that through a global social safety net, we will create equal opportunity and freedom on a global scale. Some time ago, I had Jerry Toner on the show and we talked about the norms of Roman slavery, which was a pretty heavy show. And one of the things that we recognize there is that it's labor with the threat of harm. It was a crossover, we realized, between work and prison, but it was coerced work. And then what we realized is that, at least in the United States, the threat of losing your health care is a threat of harm. And so there is a way in which, in countries that don't have a good social safety net, there is a threat of harm associated with unemployment. And so there's a level of freedom that comes from creating a safety net that is independent of employer and independent of country. And so I can see how it's different, right? If somebody's in the United States and they want to become a global nomad, they're leaving the benefits that are provided by a company. But if you are in, I don't know, Sweden, it's not the company that you're leaving, but you're leaving the country. You're leaving behind the social safety net of the region. Exactly, which is a problem from that social safety net, right? 
I love imagining this. Imagine something that works on a global scale. And we have a couple of products that work on a global scale. I use remote health. Remote health is our health insurance. And I've used it in Colombia, in Panama, in Europe, in Mexico, in Peru. I mean, sadly, I had to use it. I don't like using health insurance, but it covered me 100% of everything wherever I go. So we've done it for health. We've done it for travel. We are releasing very exciting things very soon. We're doing it. So to me, the most exciting thing about this is reaching economies of scale. As we scale our, you could say customers, you could say advocators. Your country people. Yes, our country people. <laughs> we'll be able to bring this product to more customers. We can lower the prices. We can make it available to more people. That's going to be amazing. Well, I want to provide some context for people who are not in the United States. A friend of mine, they're a couple. They're married. They're both, I think, in their 50s. She became an independent contractor, so they needed health care. It was $5,000, more than $5,000 a month for them to get health insurance in California. Wow. It's a lot. It's yeah. a, that is a lot. That is more than most people's incomes. So the safety net consists of health benefits. It consists of a pension. Was there a third thing? A way to save for retirement that's global. Correct. Which, by the way, can be redefined completely. I don't think it's that smart the way in which we do it now. So you have to forcefully wait until you're whatever age, depending on your country, and then you can do something. Maybe that's not the only way. So it's a retirement, but it's also one of my favorites. One that I'm really excited about is income protection for independent remote workers or nomads, or even people with full-time jobs. But I work as a freelancer for years in the past, and I had my own businesses. And particularly in those situations, you feel like, oh, if I get sick tomorrow, how do I provide to my family? So an income protection product that is available to everyone, basically, that sounds amazing to me. Yeah, because we shouldn't be working and making decisions about our work based upon fear. <laughs> Amen. Yes. Fear for ourselves and fear for our children. You're the head of culture and integrity. What does that mean? And in particular, what kind of demands does that title make on you? What does it mean? It's a little abstract because culture is one of those things that evolves all the time. Culture is like a reflection of a group of people. The way in which they behave, communicate, the way it feels. I believe that's culture, a good definition for culture. And integrity. It's hard to explain, but I always go to structural integrity, right? You have a bridge based on physics. It has this set of characteristics. It can hold up to whatever weight. It can be X long. So if that's a good framework to think about integrity, integrity means that you can behave in certain ways that are in line with your principles. That's sort of what it means to me. Behaving with integrity is behaving 100% in a rigid structure that aligns with your principles. It's not like you sometimes can behave with integrity and sometimes you cannot. It's not like a bridge can sometimes hold this and sometimes not. That's a weird way to explain this, but being the head of culture and integrity means that I look at our culture and I have several ways of doing that. Some of those are kind of out there and like hippie, but I look at our culture and I compare it to our ideal. We have an ideal culture in mind, which will never be the actual culture. So I compare it and I see, oh, okay, this is moving in this direction. Is that good? And most of the times it's very aligned with our ideals and our values. We hire for that too. We can talk about that too as well. So it kind of makes sense. Sometimes it doesn't. And when it doesn't, you have to pay attention, you have to unpack, you have to figure out what's happening, whether it's a localized issue, more like global issue. And same thing with integrity. 
Integrity is more hardcore, in my opinion, and less soft. If something happens that breaks the integrity of a person or the code of integrity that we want to have in Safety Wing, that's usually a big deal. Kind of never happens in Safety Wing, but you have to pay attention nonetheless. I'm getting a weird image in my head, which is the sort of the skeleton of an animal is integrity and the flesh of an animal is culture. That's cool. <laughs> yeah, that makes sense. I like it. I like that metaphor a lot because there's this idea that it's the muscles that animate. That's interesting. It's also interesting because oftentimes when we talk about people having integrity, we say they have backbone. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, you know, mm -hmm, it's this mm -hmm. idea that they actually have a structure to what they think is right and wrong. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. There was a second part to your question, though, that is the sort of lingering. The second part of the question was, what demands does that title place on you? Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. That's interesting. And that's something that I constantly reflect about. You have to represent the culture and you have to act with 100% integrity if you have this title, which is not easy to do. There's a third one, which is about conduct. But conduct in Safety Wing is not written. You have to behave correctly because you want to. Our team has adopted that principle of reciprocating good vibes, whatever you want to call it. So the title comes with that, comes with exemplifying our culture, acting with integrity, and conducting yourself in a way that is appropriate in Safety Wing. And sometimes you just wake up and your head hurts or something and your cat died, and something happened, and you have to choose whether you want to take a day off, which is probably a good idea, or present yourself appropriately. And I believe it's to make other people's life good. That's the implication. The other thing that is implied that is funny and difficult to live with is that I realize that if someone has issues with the way in which things are managed or lead or whatever, they have probably an issue with me in this case. Because I kind of represent these, our values and mission and our style, not because it's my job, because no one told me to do it, but because I think it's great. I think we do things greatly and I'm very proud to be this way and I'm very proud to evangelize. I've seen it working for years now and I think it's great. That also comes with a title, I believe. That's very interesting. A part of what you're saying is that everything that goes wrong is your fault. <laughs> what I mean is, it depends on what the source of something going wrong is. But if you're taking accountability for something that is big, potentially vague, and could mean a lot of different things to a lot of different people, and is not entirely in your control. So it's a hard thing to usher forward in the world which is a group of people who share cultural values and integrity. I'm reminded a little bit of Socrates asked the question in one of his dialogues, can virtue be taught? And his answer was no, it can't be taught because if you are being virtuous, not by instinct, but because you're trying to look virtuous, that's not virtue. Virtue is innate. And so you've got this thing that's actually very, very difficult to bring forth in the world. Yes. I will be more mundane and depart from Socrates and talk about football, like soccer. In football, you have these two. <laughs> you have the team, you have the coach, and you have the president, right? When the team wins, the team is great. The players are amazing. You have stars. When the team loses, the coach sucks. It's not exactly a perfect analogy, but it sort of works in that way. When things go wrong, the culture is wrong. When Projects are delayed, for example, or whatever, whatever issue, it's because we don't have a culture of uh, accountability, right? When projects are very successful, we have amazing team players. And I believe that's good. That's a good way to operate. It's just funny to me how it works. I want to go through what are the biggest challenges or obstacles that you face in terms of creating a culture, and then how you are working to overcome those. And I don't have to talk about it in terms of problems and obstacles. It could be opportunities 
and ways of moving forward that are positive. It doesn't have to be all blockers, but I mean, what is the environment in which you're trying to do this and what are you doing to move it forward? What I perceive as the most fundamental challenges for any culture is scale, bringing more people. Because even if you hire perfectly or close to that, people are complex units, particularly when you hire people from all over the world, literally. So I had a childhood, two parents. They were close. They are close still, thank God. They brought me up in Miraflores, which is a neighborhood in Lima. I went to Catholic French school. I drop out of high school. I have all of these events that shape my personality, that shape my worldview. I'm a highly resourceful person because I drop out of high school. I had to be resourceful to be successful, which is very different to my neighbor, let alone someone born in Tokyo. So I interpret reality through my filter of events. Everyone else does too. So although we might be similar in our value structure, in our worldview, we will differ. When you add more people, you have many more opinions. And then when you have to make decisions, you have to consider multiple dissonant opinions. The larger you get, the more true that becomes. That is a challenge. That is a very hardcore challenge, in my opinion. How do you move forward, make decisions, hear people truthfully, but still disagree? Always with someone or a group of someone's. That is challenging. So I have a weakness for analogies. You want to bring people together. They're going to be very diverse in terms of their positionality, among other things. And you want them to disagree. So you want all of that, but there's a few places where you don't want variation. One of them is in integrity. People can be as different as they want as long as they don't cross the line into doing things that are not with integrity. And you want to, this is the analogy that keeps coming to mind to me. I think of fusion where you're trying to bring things close enough together that they react inside a company. You're trying to bring them together so that you get a chemical reaction or a nuclear reaction. And they're different. And so they kind of fight against each other and they want to spread out. So what do you do? Right. That's a good question. That's the challenge. But I think there are some tools to get this forward gracefully. And to me, these are fundamentals. Values. You need a value structure for your company. And it's not negotiable. We can iterate, we can change a word, we can elaborate, we can replace maybe one with another that is adjacent, better phrase, more appropriate for the scale, whatever. You can move these values, but very slowly. This is not something that you change every day. If you have values codified, written, presented, you have a document that outlines behavior that the company supports and encourages. So. It's fair that way. So we want to do things this way. When you're joining Safety, when you're implicitly subscribing to that. And we also hire for the people who naturally align with these things. And I can give you an example. It sounds a bit hardcore, but one of our values is let the best idea win, which speaks about humility, which speaks about the power of ideas and not hierarchies. So we... As a company, expect people to behave in this way because we believe it's worth optimizing for. We have another that is create, don't copy. Because we want to get somewhere new, it doesn't make sense to just act from thinking in analogies, right? Grabbing what everyone else is doing because everyone else is doing it, but trying new things to get to new places. So I think that's a very important tool. And people are not 100, I'm not 100% aligned with this. No one is. But this is the way that we want to behave. Even if you naturally are not aligned with all 10, you might want to compromise on those areas. How do you help people to bring those on board? On the show, we had Darius Mashazadeh, and he wrote a book 
which is core value equation. And it's all about how to create your core values. And one of the key things about the core values is that they have to be usable. What he meant was that they had to be something that people could apply, but also if people in the organization couldn't say them, didn't know them in their heads, they didn't have to pull something out of their wallet and look at it. They had to know it in their heads. How do you help people to bring these on board for themselves? That's interesting. I agree with that definition, though, by the way. They have to be actionable, 100%, yes, and real as well. You see all these values, like people first, yay, who, when, us, the customers, this pernicious way of creating values to be able to manipulate them in every occasion to your advantage. That seems horrible to me. But anyway, we do a bunch of things with ours. I'm very proud of this project we did. It's a booklet that we hand out to every new team member. And it's a little out there, but it's like a book for children. So we have our value hit there, aim for the ideal, and then a cartoonish representation using birds of what that is. And the illustrations progress in a story. Because this is going to be mostly audio, I want people to know this is a beautiful hardbound book. (laughs) It looks like a children's book and it's very colorful on the inside. It looks like it's been painted with very warm watercolors. Mm -hmm, mm Mm-hmm. We have an artist named Irsan from Indonesia who works for Safety Wing full-time. And he creates illustrations all the time. That's his job. And yeah, we are big on bird illustrations because why not? I mean, we want to have fun too. So this is one of the ways, right? Everyone receives this. You get it, you go through it, it's interesting. You start becoming aware. We have a Notion page that is very popular in our team that lists our mission, vision, and values. I have an internal podcast in Safety Wing in which we have a couple of episodes about mission and values. Our values are memes in Safety Wing. People reference to those constantly in Slack or in meetings. Some of them are most popular than others. Like, be good to each other is our 10th value. That's very popular. I'd love to know which ones are the most popular in addition to that one. Aim for the ideal, our first value, is very popular, often used when trying to do something ambitious, right? Let's aim for the ideal. That's uh, one of our values. Why not? Be authentic. Many of these are, now I realize, popular, but be authentic as well. Perhaps that's not that popular, but create on copy, certainly create on copy. And this happens every day in which you have to decide what to do. There are degrees of this, right? So you need a laptop. Should you create one? Probably not. But if you're thinking about a crazy claims reimbursement solution, and you you have to choose between doing it like every other insurance in the world, perhaps you want to be a little creative with that and prioritize the user. Which, surprise, seems like a good idea. There's an interesting tension there in Create, Don't Copy, which is, on the one hand, you have to hire super experts around the world in every regional legal system, in every regional health system, and you can't get those experts without bringing on a lot of practices that they have established in environments that are very different from Safety Wing, I would imagine. So there, there must be a tension between expertise and tradition. Tradition meaning? What everybody else does. Copying. Yes. Yes, I see what you mean. It's quite hard to hire for those positions that require expertise, particularly in hard areas like uh, law or compliance. Yes, it's very challenging to find the safety wingers there. But we have, and we have amazing people in our team. There's also something to be said about being conservative versus being progressive. If you're 100% conservative, you don't go anywhere. If you're 100% progressive, you probably crash somewhere. So balancing those two, particularly when you have established products, particularly when your products are enabling people to get healthcare, 
it seems like a good idea to have the kind of people who will say, stop, 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 stop. Think about this. Let's think this through. That's useful. I face this in my own work. I work for a company that really values original thought. And so a part of that is hiring very smart people and letting them figure it out without a lot of received wisdom. And on the other hand, until recently, I was running a process improvement team. And the thing is that there's a whole world of pre-existing tools that you don't have to reinvent and that are very powerful and that have been developed by smart people who were being original once upon a time. And the fact that it's received wisdom doesn't mean it wasn't people just like you, smart people being original that solved problems and you don't have to resolve them. It's a little bit like what you're talking about. On the other hand, what you want is you want to teach, what I want anyway, is I want to teach people how to use those tools and I want them to doubt them every day. They need to have skepticism about the tools. They need to ask themselves whether or not they need to be applied the same way. It's hard to both learn and doubt at the same time. But that's a very valuable skill is to learn things and doubt them. Oh, yeah. I don't know why this came to my mind, but I'm sure you're familiar with the ENPS score, the Employee Net Promoter score. That is the industry standard. I haven't found a person who can explain why you do it this way. And I believe that if you're adopting a best practice, I think it's fundamental that you understand it. If not, what are you doing? How are you interpreting this? So I try to look for that. I talk to engineers, I talk to HR professionals, I talk to everyone that I could, and no one could explain me why you take advocators and you subtract this people, these neutrals, and then you take, I mean, there is an equation for that. So I don't do that anymore. I do an average from one to 10, which seems much more human. The team is feeling an eight, amazing. Or in comparison, the team is feeling a 43 and we're not counting sevens and eights or <laughs> whatever the <laughs> envious thing is. We had on the show, the inventor of the net promoter score. Oh my God. But that's for products. It is for products. But I'll tell you that he had written his eighth book or something like that, or 12th book. I can't remember what it is. And I said, why did you write another book? He says, because nobody really understands what net promoter score is. And so it gets misused. And so what he's done is he's released into the world this idea that's very contagious. But people pick it up without doing what you did, which is ask, why is this here? And because they don't ask that question, they misuse it. And I think it makes sense for products, though. And to me, the baseline of why it makes sense and we use it is because you have a benchmark, an international, across industries or within industry, a huge archive of what's good. So in that case, I believe it's very powerful. Yes, when used right. And his point was that oftentimes in companies that use it, they attach it to rewards to the organization and then everybody starts gaming it and you can't tell oh, yes. what's real. Oh, yes. And people get punished if they get below a three, I mean, below a whatever. And so people forget that what net promoter score is for is if you love your customer, you pay attention to what they want and you want it for their sake. And that's, that's what it's for. Exactly, exactly. We, we have a value that's all about that, which is very coincidental, but make things people love. That's something worth optimizing for because if not, what are we doing? You see what I mean? You can have a company, whatever, financial incentive, whatever, whatever. But if I'm working here in Safety Wing for three years, many people are as well. If you're not doing something valuable for others, there is no intrinsic motivation. It's only external things like salary or whatever. We treasure that a lot. We treasure our customers. We do it for them. It's the only way that I can see. Let's do one other popular one from the book. One other popular value. It's interesting. There's popular ones which people like to use to make decisions. And then there are probably some that are critical because they influence a fork in a road. 
that's a Venn diagram, which is things people use all the time. But also there's this other one, which is the ones that help you make the hard decisions. Exactly right. And exactly what I was thinking while reviewing this. Yes, I can give an example of both. Something that people use all the time. Dare to make mistakes. Oh yeah. Oh yeah, that one is important. Because people make mistakes. And that's okay. That's one of our slogans or memes. So that's very popular, I think, in the right way, because you could manipulate that and use it to justify your mistake, which defeats the point. You shouldn't need to justify your mistake because people make mistakes and we dare to make mistakes. So that's often used during product work, during creative work. It should be used to take risk. Yes. Not to justify error. And so it's... We're going to prototype something. We know it's going to be a bit of a mess. We're going to test it. And it's okay. It's a learning thing. Exactly. That sort of example. We're trying to create a culture in which you don't have to apologize for your error. So we don't see it used there because there is no opportunity for that, I guess. One that is used to make hard decisions is, I don't know if this is maybe unusual, but in safety wing is very usual. We are common. Be good to each other. That's a hardcore one for us. I think in our current configuration, we have no assholes. So happy about that. And it's a joy. It's so joyful. So I talk to everyone in our team consistently, to every single person in the company in some sort of cadence. And that's like a perk. I design it as part of my role. And I think it's a blessing to be able to have as much context, to be able to establish relationships with people. You know, I talk to people for like years now and we know each other, we have a relationship. So that builds trust. And that is very good for the company because they can trust me if things are not working the way they should. And I, in return, help people to navigate situations. I get to live this every day. The day is going to come where you can't talk to every person. And maybe you're reaching that point. I don't know how big safety wing is. 150. 150. So there's going to come a point where you can't, potentially. I'll probably enlarge the cadence, make it less frequently, but I don't plan to stop this. There are some things that don't scale gracefully, but you still do them. Yeah, I can totally see that. For some reason, I'm able to tie this episode and what we're talking about to a lot of previous episodes more than usual. We had two people on who spoke about the culture at Bridgewater, and Bridgewater was a place where it was all about testing ideas and let the best idea win, but it was through, I'm going to say, a modality of public humiliation. What some people have said is that, yeah, it was a horrible experience, but I learned so much it was worth it. And other people have felt just completely broken by it and never recovered. And so different people have responded to it in different ways. And I've seen it because I've done peer-reviewed science things. And it can be a challenging environment where ideas are challenged without humiliation. So you can challenge ideas and still be kind. And so what strikes me is that with the values, like the ones you're talking about, is that, let me just say, presenting a scientific paper to the department was like running a gauntlet. It was like being whacked logically by lots of people as you went by. It also felt really wholesome and really really good. But I would imagine that there might be tensions, like when you're developing a value system, there might be tensions within the value system that are positive, but polarities. I don't know if that's a question. There is something there. There is something interesting there to me, which is my mind went immediately to two things, different cultures for different people. I don't claim that the safety wing culture is better than anything else or for everyone more than anything else. It's for safety wingers. And we use that during recruiting and uh, very gracefully, I would say. And we immediately see that when there is someone who's not a good fit, 
it's so glaringly present. So different cultures for different people. Some people are very competitive. Some people love debating aggressively. In Safety Wing, we have a conduct behavior that is very respectful, very kind, very honest too. Sometimes honesty can burn. But if you're respectful and kind, it is challenging, but you don't feel awful. I mean, I feel sometimes I feel uh, dumb. Oh, that was really dumb. Why did I bring this idea? Why am I so dumb? But because I recognize the value of the other idea, right? And I'm highly neurotic. So my personality goes there, right? But then think about it. Okay. Was my idea the best? Probably not. Is the other idea better? Yeah, it is. Can I get behind it? Hell yes. And there is a why there. Why can you get behind things that are not your own? And I believe that's our mission because we really want to do this thing. So that mission, that global objective, many times defeats the localized objectives. And I believe that makes great teams. That makes functional teams. This leads into a question I was going to ask, which was, how does your job feel on a good day? And how does it feel on a bad day? And why? I'll tell you a part of why I ask, is that there are a number of listeners who are in roles similar to yours, and I bet you they face the same thing. (laughs) I would say 80% of my days are remarkably good. 20% remarkably awful. That's not because of Safety Wing, I should clarify. That's because of my turbulent personality and neuroticism. Well, yeah, fair enough. You know, that's a distribution. I got the rough end of it, and that's fine. It's also a tool, but we can, we can talk about that other time. So for someone with this neurological predisposition to negative emotion, having 80% good days is so good. It's so good. I've never experienced this previously. So why good days? I wake up. I feel rough for an hour, have my coffee, I'm ready. And I have a list of things to do that I created for myself. That is very important. I'm not following anyone's aleatory with little context idea. I'm following my insights. And that doesn't mean that I don't debate and socialize these ideas. I do. And many times they get influenced by other people, people who I respect a lot. So it's good. But I have a list of things to do that I designed for myself. I talk to a lot of people every day, three, four people, just like one-on-ones meetings. How are you doing? How are things? How is your career? How is the culture? How are you feeling? How is your son? There are a lot of things to talk about. And that makes me happy. Sometimes I don't want to do it. Sometimes I'm tired or I'm moody, but I get myself to do it. And I always enjoy it so much. And I have autonomy. So I go to the gym at 2 p.m. because I can. And I play with my sons at 5 p.m. And then at 8 p.m. I'm back to work because I like it that way. And because I like to work at nights, particularly creative work. That's a good day. A bad day is I go on a meeting and I present something and someone has a bureaucratic process in between my idea and its execution that I don't agree with. So I basically struggle with conservative types. I recognize their importance, but that demotivates me greatly. Bad day is also we have to let someone go. That sucks. I get to do exit interviews. You are personally involved in all of those cases? Yes. I give my two cents from my perspective from speaking with everyone. I do have a perspective that is like an aggregation of everyone's filtered through my own. So it's not perfect, but I do. It's always tough. It's always depressing. I feel some instinct to be compassionate, but I thought about this a lot because that compassion point was bothering me. And my conclusion was that when you have to make difficult decisions, particularly in safety wing, we are being compassionate with the world, with a bunch of people that will benefit from our products if we succeed. 
And we need the absolute best team to do that. Someone I know at work said to me, clarity is kindness. There's a couple of different things. That's not exactly aligned with what you're talking about. But this idea, though, that probably that person will find a place that's more suited. Oh, yes. You're so right. And I'm, I'm so glad that you bring this up. It's always the case. Being a good fit is like kind of cuts both ways. And if you're not a good fit for Safety Wing, for example, Safety Wing is not a good fit for you, most likely. I mean, I would say 100% of the times. And why would anyone do that? So that's perfectly true. I have a few closing questions that I ask everybody. What do you hire your job to do for you? Your company hires you to do something for it. What do you hire it to do for you? I guess I can interpret this question loosely. I applied for this job. I changed careers to do this right then. So I believe that people should be able to enjoy their lives, generally speaking. And that is a little elitist because the world doesn't work like that always. And we are in a position of privilege. Within that, those rules, I think that people should be able to enjoy their lives while they can, because things change all the time. But if you can, if you're able to have the opportunity to enjoy your life, work is a big part of it. And being miserable at work is the thing that I wanted to combat, that I wanted to fix. I joined the perfect company for that. The perfect company that aligns with my mission almost 100%. So I don't know if this addresses your question directly, but I wanted to do this and I get to do it. Now it's becoming part of my mission to expand this as much as possible, to evangelize this way as much as possible, hopefully get to influence other people and other companies. Do you get to see the effects of your work on helping people enjoy their lives? Yes, 100%, yes. And it feels amazing. And many times I wish I could enjoy it more because many times I'm focused on what I should solve and fix and not, for example, as I told you, we calculate ENPS, we do an average from zero to 10 or one to 10, and we routinely score above nine which is insane, but it is what it is. And I think about the one that we could improve and not the nine that we achieve. I tend to think about the things to improve and I don't get to enjoy as much as I could the success. That's just part of my personality. You might consider expanding the people you talk to on a routine basis to people who are receiving benefit from your products. Yes, that's a good idea. Yes, yes. It's easy to just add a few in and then talk to them about what it means in their lives. Like user interviews, but yeah, yeah, that's, that's super cool. But really, the user interviews are, I mean, first of all, it's a legitimate part of your job. Or is our culture creating the thing that you want? But the other thing is just to put a feedback loop on what you hire your job to do for you. Oh, that's such a good idea. I, I'm going to run with it, it's actually. Such a good idea. <laughs> and it's easy. I, I just call them. Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. We have a process for that. So I just, This is Adrian. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Are you interested in insurance? No, I'm kidding. <laughs> <laughs> uh, what does your job cost you? I'm very involved in safety wing, meaning I work many hours. Not because I have to, but because I want to. And because I'm not a very organized person. I struggle with personal management or time management. So I compensate with time, which is my currency. I think it's a fair deal. But that prevents me from doing other things. I well, should also say I have too many interests in life. And I won't get to do all of them. So I have to prioritize. But with that said, I do get to do the things that I want to do. I, I'm with my family. I work at home. I choose to do it this way, to be with my family. I've been able to see how my two boys developed in this world. They're five and 10 now. 
I get to do art, which is a very important part of my life, photography and music, and I just need to do art. I incorporate this art into my job, not directly, but indirectly, quite a bit, actually. So yeah, the cost is that I, I wish I could also do whatever other interests I have, but it's pretty good. If you have to have an, a cost, opportunity cost is one of the mm. best. <laughs> That's that's the one. Right. That's exactly the one. <laughs> there should be a t-shirt or something. <laughs> Where can people learn more about you and about Safety Wing? About Safety Wing. Safetywing.com. That's a good place to start. And about me, uh, just uh, LinkedIn. Adrian Salazar at LinkedIn should get you to me. Fantastic. Thank you very much for coming on the show. Really interesting conversation. Thank you. Thank you. It's been great. Thank you. Thanks for joining me for another episode of Work for Humans. If you enjoyed this episode, please give us a five-star rating wherever you listen to podcasts and share the show with one person you think would get value from it. Believe it or not, this really helps us grow the show and reach more people who want to build the kind of work that people really want. As always, thank you to my producer, Jason Ames at Ninth Path Audio for his insights into content and his high standard for quality. Final note, the opinions shared here are my own and not the views of Google or Cisco Systems. Thanks again for listening. See you next time.